Well, welcome to the uh, Windbreaks session here. I'm Billy, I'll be the moderator. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Eric Ogdahl from the University of Minnesota, discussing establishment and potential snow storage capacity of shrub willow living snow fences in South Central Minnesota. Uh, we'll do a 20 minute talk, we'll have five minutes for Q&A, and then we'll have five minutes for, to switch room. So, <laughs> good morning, Eric. All right, yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. And I'm gonna kind of continue the Minnesota living snow fence session here, um, talking about using shrub willows for living snow fences. And this is kind of, um, like David said, we've got a big research team working on living snow fence issues in Minnesota, and this is kind of another project um, working with that. Um, so I'm gonna provide you a little overview on living snow fences and, and willows, and then kind of talk about some of our project goals and uh, research questions and get into some of our methodology results and then discuss some implications. Um, so, you know, kind of similar to David, if you're at his talk, uh, this is going to be a reiteration, but if, in case you weren't here, um, this is probably a scene that's familiar to you if you've uh, driven through a lot of the northern states in the U.S. and as well as Canada, um, where snow is creating hazardous road conditions. And this is a concern for accidents, like you see here, but also um, for cost in uh, snow removal. So uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation spends about an average of $84 million per year on snow removal costs. And kind of with that comes uh, uh, an environmental cost of uh, salt application. So it's estimated for every teaspoon of road salt, uh, it only takes one teaspoon of road salt to permanently pollute five gallons of water. So any road salt that gets off the road into waterways that can be a concern for um, aquatics. And water quality. Um, so, you know, this this is important to getting us through the winter, but anything we can do to kind of reduce our need for snow removal could probably not, um, reduce our transportation costs and as well as impact on the environment. And, uh, okay, picture the show, but, but uh, kind of like David mentioned, a uh, common solution to this is uh, the use of snow fences, which are linear barriers designed to trap snow coming from up on the fields and uh, blowing towards the road. And they can be either uh, living snow fences or structural snow fences. This is a picture of a living snow fence uh, made up of spruce. And another common living snow fence are these uh, standing corn rows that farmers will leave near the edge of the road. And then also, as I mentioned, structural snow fences. This is one on the University of Minnesota's St. Paul campus. Um, and uh, a little bit of how they work, they trap most of the snow in the downwind side of the snow fence, and so when they're installed on a road, you kind of allow for enough distance to accommodate that downwind rip, that's what's called the setback distance. And kind of regarding the effectiveness of snow fences, this is just kind of a picture, this is a picture that David showed, um, kind of a picture that MnDOT uses to show the effectiveness on the left panel, you have a, a MnDOT truck driving down on an icy road, and then off in the distance is this living snow fence, and then in this right panel you have that truck in that location protected by the snow fence. And you can see the difference. And like David said, this, uh, this kind of has an economic benefit for every dollar MnDOT invests in a snow fence, they save, they save around $14 in summer removal costs. So it's a pretty, pretty big effect. And uh, this kind of led MnDOT to collaborate with state and federal agencies to uh, create a cost share program that could help miners, landowners to pay the cost of putting in living snow fences on their land. But uh, kind of despite this program and the societal benefits of snow fences, the adoption rate of living snow fences is still pretty low in Minnesota. We have about 1,200 miles of uh, state roadways that have been identified by MnDOT as uh, severe flowing snow problems. And only about 30 of those, 30 miles of um, 12 those 1200 miles have been addressed in use of uh, snow fences. So uh, MnDOT kind of wanted to understand why adoption rates are so low, and they went out and, with the University of Minnesota Extension, interviewed farmers in southern Minnesota, and kind of what they found is, um, like we're seeing with a lot of labor forestry practices, they're concerned about taking their cropland out of production. So this kind of led to the question, was there a way to meet production with road protection which kind of led to the question, is there a commodity that could um, provide an effective living snow fence? Or by commodity, I mean uh, kind of alternative source of income for farmers. And what researchers came up with was um, the use of shrub willows 
These have been kind of research for the past 30, 40 years around the world for uh, bioenergy production. We've been hearing a lot about it at this conference. And uh, trombolas have also been successfully adopted in New York State. They've done a lot of research behind using scrub bullets for snow fences there. So we were interested to see if these would work in Minnesota. And kind of both for a snow fence, um, snow fence protection, but also as a bottomless commodity. Um, today I'm going to mainly focus on, uh, on the snow fence side of the, the question. So we're still kind of working on the biomass commodity, but I could discuss that after the presentation. Um, so to address this question, we set up uh, experiments in southern Minnesota at the Southern Research and Outreach Center in Wasika, Minnesota. It's a, tip, a primarily agricultural research station. And we set up two sites. We set up an actual living snow fence with different shrub willow varieties and then also uh, variety plots to compare the growth of shrub willows to uh, traditional snow fence species that mid uses like uh, um, dogwood and American cranberry. And I'm going to mainly focus on this living snow fence part today. We uh, wanted to test out three willow varieties that had been previously used in willow trials in Minnesota that we had pretty good results with. Um, these were Fish Creek, Lunata, and S365. And then we also wanted to test out two different planting arrangements. So two, two row snow fences, that's kind of the um, standard uh, New York design for their roll of snow fences. But we also wanted to test out four rows to see if that had an ad added uh, snow capture effect. And also kind of thinking about the biomass side of it, you could say harvest two rows one year, leave two rows for protection and then come back and harvest those other two rows. So kind of have a staggered harvest pattern for biomass. And so we, uh, we randomly assigned varieties and um, row arrangements to, uh, to, to plots. And we had four, four replicates sold. This kind of ended up in a snow fence of about a quarter mile long. Uh, we planted these in the summer of 2013. It took us uh, about three hours to plant a quarter, quarter mile snow fence. We had 11 people. And uh, we used these dormant uh, eight inch willow stem cuttings that we got from the breeding program in New York. And uh, if you haven't seen those before, you pretty much just plant them in the ground and they develop shoots and roots from there. And then this is kind of what they look like by the end of the first growing season. And after that we came through and we coppiced the willows, kind of a standard willow practice to uh, generate more stems in a denser shrub. And then uh, this is a little bit of what they look like at the end of the second growing season. And just some quick statistics on the growth. We had an average survival of 89% and uh, an average height of about a little over a meter. So we wanted to see, do these work as right, snow fences? And we kind of used two, two methods to assess that. We used some theoretical, uh, or some models that have been developed by past snow fence research, as well as uh, empirical measurements. So actually going out and measuring the snow around these snow fences. And with the model approach, we, we, we used models that were developed by this fellow down here on the right is Ron Tabler. He was a hydrologist and an engineer out of Wyoming, which has a lot of open spaces, a lot of blowing snow problems. He kind of spent his whole career studying the physics of snow movement and applying those concepts to develop models that um, transportation personnel, natural resource professionals can use to develop um, effective snow fences. And kind of at the core of these models was this idea of snow transport, which he defined as the mass of snow transported by wind or specified with the cross the, with the, cross the wind. And so we kind of developed different models where you could um, determine how much snow transport a snow fence could catch, which he defined as the snow storage capacity, as well as how much snow is being transported for the at the location of, of the snow fence for a specific, um, for a specific region. And by kind of comparing snow storage capacity to mean annual transfer, you can get this ratio where if it's equal to one or greater, theoretically that means that your um, snow fence could catch all of the mean annual transfer at, at a site. And so this is kind of the approach we took for our site. We use climate, climatology data from um, the Wasika Research Center, and we combine that with, um, oh, 
interesting. Um, well, this is, we combine that with the fetch distance me measurement at our site, um, which is kind of defined as the, the amount of space over which snow can blow free freely, over which there are no, no barriers to trap that snow. We found an average fetch distance of uh, 13, 1,330 meters at our site. And so we combine that with climatology data. So we found that for our site, there's a, on average, we have 40 tons of snow blowing across our site over, over a winter. And so we want to determine how, how much of that um, is being caught by the willows. And what we did there is we used kind of two, two predictors that Tabler identified as um, you know, strongly influencing the snow storage capacity of the, of the snow fences. These are the, the height of the snow fence and the porosity or amount of open space in the snow fence. And kind of the ra relationship as height goes up, your snow storage capacity goes up. And for, as porosity decreases, your snow storage capacity increases. So with, with the density of shrub, you're getting more snow storage. And so we measured height just by simply going out with a ruler, measuring the height of our willows. And then for porosity, we used this big red dexter <coughs> and put it behind our snow fence. We did this at multiple locations, locations along the snow fence site. Um, and then we uh, calculated the porosities and heights for our different treatments. And this is just kind of showing. So what we did with porosity, we put these photos into Photoshop, and then we were able to calculate the amount of background pixels um, in the pictures, and then compare that to the overall pixel, overall amount of pixels, and that gives us the uh, percent porosity for our different treatments. And then we uh, we put these metrics into Tabler's models. Um, to get this kind of summary table here. And what we found for storage capacity is, is that when you compare that to the mean annual transport, um, all the ratios are less than one. So, you know, theoretically, after two growing seasons, these willows weren't um, at the storage capacity to catch all the mean annual transport. Uh, but we wanted to see what these could be uh, in future years, and some research from Syracuse University in New York had developed models for willow snow fences between the, the age of the snow fence and the height and porosity of the snow fences, so you could predict what the snow storage capacity would be in future years. And we developed, we uh, put those, we applied that to our snow fence, and we set, we found that for um, for four rows, this data line. They, they could be, they could exceed this annual snow transport after three years, and for two rows, this would be after uh, after four rows or four four years. Um, so that's that's kind of what the theoretical models are saying. And then we addressed, we also went out and did the empirical measurements. Uh, we went out and measured snow snow depth along transects in each plot kind of oriented to the prevailing wind directions which were kind of a west northwest and then um, what we found is that variety the willow variety didn't really have a big effect on which plots caught more snow but it was mainly the number of rows so four rows tended to catch more snow than two rows which we kind of expect uh, expect due to the, the denser porosity of the of the four row treatments and this was, I think this was kind of, four rows had an effect of catching at 1.2 times the snow depth of, of two rows. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of show you, we, we did observe that um, at each of our measuring dates that uh, the, the snow fences were catching snow. Unfortunately, we weren't able to compare these to the, the model results because they, they assume that for a, for a winter, you, have, you don't have any melting dates, you don't have any above freezing dates. But we had quite a few this winter. Um, so, but we, we, did, we did see that, you know, at each, at each of our observation dates, these were catching snow and, and, um, and functioning. Um, and then this is just kind of one of our pictures. This was kind of the first snow event of, the, of this past winter. And you can see this is a four row treatment here and a, a two row treatment next to it. And then this is a um, picture of them in January. So kind of conclusions, willows are easily planted, are fast growing and generally have good survival rates. Theoretically, they were unable to catch all the snow, 
after two growing seasons, but they could potentially be catching all the snow after three and four growing seasons. And um, empirically, we saw that four rows tend to catch more snow than two rows, and uh, they're all catching snow throughout the, uh, throughout the, the winter. Um, so kind of some of the next steps are assessing what's, what are the economics of these willow snow fences, you know, what's, what can be the benefit to farmers, and that kind of comes along with the biomass assessment. And then one of our original goals was to assess the salt reductions related to these snow fences, but uh, we weren't able to, MnDOT didn't have any kind of baseline data on the salt adaptation for our roadway, so we weren't able to assess that in uh, this research project, but hopefully it would be something that could be assessed in, in future projects. And we're also looking at some of the ecosystem services that are provided by these snow fences. I'm mainly focusing on uh, soil carbon sequestration, still being worked on, but uh, we've also done, you know, interest in what's the pollinator potential in the snow fences. And uh, these are some of the flowers from this year, and uh, I think that would be some potential for future research. And so I want to wrap it up and thank my uh, Living Snow Fence project team, Jomi Zamora, Gary Wyatt, Greg Johnson with the uh, Wasika Station Team Current from the Department of Forest Resources, Dan Gullickson, our MnDOT Forester, and David Smith, who just presented, he's our flight economics student, and then also thanks to the Center for Transportation Studies at the U of M, uh, Southern Research and Outreach Center at Wasika. We've got a lot of 4-H students and Boy Scouts help out on this project. Also, many friends and family. And then just to thank our sponsors, Minnesota Department of Transportation, University of Minnesota Extension, and the Local Rural Research Board in Minnesota. And uh, for more information, you can go to this snow control tools, snow control tools.umn.edu, and then this snowfence.umn tool is a, it's a design tool kind of incorporating the um, tablet models um, so landowners can design and make snow and so thank you, and I'll be glad to take any questions. We've got six minutes for questions. So, Eric, you can repeat them. I mean, sir. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, just a comment, given that we all face the same challenge here in Iowa, I was thinking quickly that maybe Minnesota and Wisconsin should look at oh, learning something or some sort of collaborative, something for your lab to chew on with Wisconsin and West. Folks that are interested, probably have to find some industry support as well. Um, some two row harvest area. You know, that's scaling and not get down with the, the uh, brush stock. Right. But if we're going to see any sort of adoption of growers are going to want to know how you harvest it and what to see it. Right. So to get that equipment. We should know that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the comment was uh, just on um, collaborating with other states that uh, have snow problems and, you know, as well as uh, willow trials to um, have a uh, harvester that we could share. Where you can harvest it? Do you harvest willows the entire year? Uh, is there a specific time of the year that you harvest? Typically in the fall. So the question was, do you harvest willows at any time of the year? And it's typically after after the growing season. Yeah, it, it, it should be with every three years. Four. Yeah, every three, three years. So if you I, had, if you had rows of four or rows of two, you'd always have a four row if you're harvesting every third year. You follow what I'm saying? You plant every third year and harvest every third year. Well, they, I mean, well not every third year, harvesting every year, but you're always leaving two four rows or two rows sit. Right. So yeah. you get the max, maximum catch and put what are you talking about? Harvest time, three months, period? Well, you, I mean, they're typically harvested every three to four years. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think ideally it's from a plant regrowth that we can harvest in spring, plus get that next year's regrowth so you don't lose a winter, so you a two row system for the regrowth on the school and still have six feet tall by the end of that year. Yeah. Uh, but Bring that into the soil condition right to the site. Yeah. So if you're dealing with snow, load is just down, so it's not buried in the willow. So you can get it there. <laughs> well, you know, you, all you guys got ag engineering departments. Let them participate in those you right. A harvester that you can collect and everything from one pass, you're not missing. 
you know, you know, it's. I think part of the study is that we have a variety of drugs, and uh, what we, one of the treatments that we include in that drug is harvesting the fall as well as our harvesting in this process. So we're trying to look into whether there is going to be a different difference of the performance of this species uh, based on harvesting the for the current time of the year. But when, but you know, for, for logistics for somebody who is used doing cellulose, they would want a steady stream so you have no storage factor in there and you don't have to handle it twice. So if you harvest on a continuous basis and develop varieties that could be harvested at different points continuously through the year, you, you should be able then to <coughs> easily supply a regional cellulose plant with fresh stock instead of dry stock. You know, you get dry stock, you get to put moisture back into it to do your, your enzymatic uh, breakdown and, and uh, pre-treatment. So if it's coming in already with 30%, 40% moisture, it's one less input cost that you eliminate. Yeah. Eric, great talk. And, and before we get off this line, you know, I think that really speaks to sort of a coordinated biofeedstock strategy for communities and towns because you wouldn't be just looking at living snow fences. Uh, I think the other example by Sinran is using uh, the College of Waste to then also grow additional ones so you can create that critical mass within that 30 mile radius for it. So you're not looking at just living snow fences to do it. Uh, the question I have on uh, my great ride across I-80 is I'm seeing dead deer. I'm noticing on some of these either aesthetic plantings or snow fence plantings. I'm not sure what Iowa did on 80. There was a lot of shrub skeletons. And so, uh, Greg, maybe you can uh, address this. It's the idea of having a stress pest resistance out there. And so it's, that always speaks to diversity or knowing uh, what your plant out there can handle. And it may speak to having Diversified grows, yep, yep. Or, or something. I don't know how are you guys starting to address that. Yeah, well, I mean that's kind of the yeah. So the question was having you know, diversified um, plants to uh, be more resilient to disease and outbreaks, stuff like that. Yeah, I mean so that's one of one of the ideas behind our testing multiple variety multiple varieties in the snow fence. You know, and since we saw that variety wasn't really in in fact, on the snow catch, we can incorporate multiple varieties. Um, but yeah, also, I think incorporating other grub species. And that's something that Min Minda often does a lot. They'll often have a snow fence, so, you know, multiple, multiple grub, grub species. But just the idea of just not one good performing species, but a variety, so that yep. if you have that gap, it'll be filled in. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. Yeah.